We've come to the end of our church membership series. Um, we've talked along the way in the process about what the church is and how to join it and what our responsibilities to it are. And we've also talked about the unique history and doctrine of the CMA. And in the process, we've gained some understanding of what the fourfold gospel symbol means, which is right there next to our name. And now finally, in our final study this morning, we're going to talk about the mission of our church. That is to say, we're going to ask the question, why does Niagara Lines Church exist? What's our purpose? And how do we understand the mission here? And I realize I'm breaking into Advent a little bit. I ran out of time. I had to have one more week to get this done, and then we'll pick up with our Advent stuff next week. Uh, but uh, that is what we're going to talk about this week here is what's our purpose? Why do we exist? So we can wrap this study up. And that purpose is sitting um, right in front of our face every week. It's right under the name. It is to enhance lives with God's truth. Again, our purpose here is to enhance lives with God's truth. In other words, our purpose is to make people's lives better by faithfully deploying God's word. And that sounds kind of simple. It sounds kind of obvious. But the distinction is important because it's possible to deploy God's word in error and to make people's lives worse. It's possible. People do it all the time. This is why the Bible so often warns against false teachers. If you look throughout the New Testament, there's so many warnings about false teachers for that reason. False teaching makes people's lives worse, not better. And this is what we seek to avoid. So this morning, we're going to look at three ways, very briefly, that we enhance lives with God's truth. And we'll also look at what to avoid in the process. But this morning, three ways to enhance lives with God's truth. The outlines are up on the bistro tables. If you don't already have one, it's very simple uh, if you want to follow along. But here it is. First, um, we enhance lives by promoting acceptance rather than condemnation. We enhance lives by promoting acceptance rather than condemnation. Now, at the very heart of the gospel is the universal acceptance of, of all mankind. And I'll say that again. At the very heart of the gospel is the universal acceptance of all mankind. And if you don't believe me, look at one of the most famous verses in all of scriptures. That is uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. All right? There is a reason why this verse is so well known and that everyone can quote it. It's because it declares very plainly and very clearly that we already have God's love now. Do you see it there? It's saying without, you know, there's no ambiguity there. It's saying we already have God's love. Everybody already has it. It states that before we acknowledge God in any way whatsoever, his love for us is already so intense that he laid down everything he had for us to make our redemption possible. Do you understand what this means? It means that God accepts us as we are. It means that even before, even before we repent and receive him, his arms are actually wide open, ready to receive us. He's already in that posture. It means that nothing must be done to earn his acceptance. We already have it. And this is why Paul said what he did in Romans 5.8. For God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while we were still in that sinful state. That is when he died for us. God accepts us in whatever condition we come. That is what it's saying here. So that means he accepts us when we are natives. He accepts us when we are foreigners. He accepts us when we are wealthy. He accepts us when we are in debt. He accepts us when we are productive in society. And he accepts us when we live on government existence. He accepts us when we are clean. He accepts us when we are addicted to drugs. Do you follow what I'm saying here? He accepts us in every condition. God loves us now. And he paid the ultimate price for us while we were at our worst. Therefore, the gospel begins with unconditional acceptance. And we enhance people's lives when we preach God's unconditional acceptance to others. Okay? When we start any, anywhere else... But God's unconditional love and his unconditional acceptance for all mankind, we are actually not preaching the gospel. When we begin with condemnation of any kind, when we begin with guilt or shame, uh, when we communicate that people cannot be received by God until they deal with something in their lives, 
We are not preaching the gospel. We are not enhancing lives with God's truth. It is as simple as that. And this comes to mind because in a well-meaning way, we can do that and not realize it. In my last ministry, um, I can remember that I regularly was criticized there for the lack of guilt that came through in my preaching and the lack of people coming forward to the altar to repent and recommit and stuff like that at the end of the services. I caught a lot of flack for that. And I had people come up to me and look at me in the eyes and say, Pastor Dan, I just don't feel bad when I listen to you preach. They said it to me all the time. They, and, and where are they coming from here? They, they understood church as a place to get motivated, you know, to, to strive and to do better. That's what they understood it as. And so when they didn't feel the guilt being laid on them to motivate them, they thought, thought, thought something was off. I tried to explain to them that's not how the gospel works. And uh, it just didn't click with so many there. But some of you might be asking, what about conviction of sin? What about changed life? Are you saying these aren't important? Aren't these important? Don't we need to strive? Don't we need to change? Of course it is important for us to change. Of course conviction is important. All I'm saying here is those are not our responsibility. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the conviction. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the life transformation. Our job is to preach God's unconditional acceptance and then let God from there handle the rest, for him to handle the conviction, for him to handle the life change. And we enhance people's lives when we do that. We introduce harm, and we actually make people's lives worse when we try to take on the job of conviction and transformation ourselves. Does that make sense? I've said this before, we make a very lousy Holy Spirit, but when we just st stick to the gospel and we just preach God's acceptance and let him handle those things, uh, things are much better all the way around. So that's the first way. Uh, but we also enhance lives by promoting confidence rather than fear. We enhance lives by promoting confidence rather than fear. The gospel dispels fear 100% of the time. The gospel, when you're hearing it correctly, dispels fear. It never encourages fear. Never. And this is why John said in 1 John, cha uh, verses seven, 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, by this, Love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. No fear. Thus, when we use our mouths to sow fear in people and to unsettle the hearts of our fellow man, we're actually working against the gospel and we are not enhancing lives when we sow fear in the hearts of people. Nonetheless, the scriptures are often misused to sow fear in people, whether it be fear that God will strike us dead for some sin or fear that we might get in an accident on the way home and then live eternally, you know, apart from God, or fear that someone who doesn't share our convictions, Christian values, might come to rule over us and impose their secular will on us. The fear comes in all shapes and sizes, right from the Christian community sometimes. None of this enhances people's lives. None of it. In reality, it makes people worse, not better. We enhance lives by instilling confidence in the hearts of our fellow man that is based upon the truth of Scripture. And there are two main types of confidence that we're called to instill. Two, I'm, there's more than this, but I'm just boiling it down to two for the sake of simplicity. The first is we, ca uh, we are called to instill confidence in God's love. And by the way, God's love is unchanging. We are called to always instill in our fellow man confidence in God's love. Just as he accepts us from the very beginning, that never changes. He's always going to accept us. God is not going to change his mind about us regardless of how often and how repeatedly we mess up. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to stop loving us. We're not going to out -sin his grace. Again, this isn't a license to sin. It's just a reality. He's not going to change how he feels about us, no matter how bad we mess up. And we enhance lives when we instill this confidence in people. We actually hurt people when we start to give them the impression that if they mess up enough times, God might change his mind about them. We are also called to instill confidence in God's victory, which is assured. We're called to instill confidence in God's victory, which is assured. There is no geopolitical development that's going to change the final outcome of the world. 
There is no reason to fear. There is no reason to take, ar- take up arms for the faith and such things as that. None of that needs to be done. Again, we have every reason to be confident that every victory is won, the kingdom of God is advancing as it should be, and in the end, God's purposes are going to be perfectly completed. And we, in- we enhance lives when we instill this type of confidence in people. We make them worse. We hurt them when we sow fear and uncertainty and unsettle their hearts as though we're not secure. Um, If we believe the truth of God's word, we have every reason to be confident, and we have every reason to encourage others to be confident as well. So that's the second way. Lastly, we enhance lives by promoting faith rather than superstition. Enhance lives by promoting faith rather than superstition. Now, to be clear, what do I mean by faith versus superstition? What I mean by faith is belief that is rooted and informed by knowledge. In other words, I may believe and practice a certain way, but I come to that belief out of what I study and read from the Bible and from the historical record and from the disciplines of science which are rooted in God's creation and such things as that. And so my faith is rooted in rigorous study that is based upon facts that we learn from God's truth. What we mean by superstition is belief that is in to knowledge and facts. Uh, the former is the foundation of Christian faith and practice, and it enhances lives. The latter is kind of idolatrous and primitive, and it actually brings reproach to the faith. And I'll, I'll illustrate what I mean in a second, uh, but so you can understand what I mean between faith and superstition, okay? Faith, for example, when we talk about, we talk about physical healing over the past few weeks. Faith, an example of that would be praying, f- you, when you were sick, praying for healing, and then going to the doctor, and then pursuing all the obvious common sense forms of medical treatment that are available to us that are all a function of God's creation and his wisdom and the things that he put into this earth. Faith uses the common sense to take advantage of all those things and prays for healing at the same time. It's all together. It all works together. Superstition prays for healing and then shuns the doctor because I prayed. Does that make sense? It's a different thing. It's in opposition to knowledge. Another way would be in terms of gathering here. Faith prays for God's protection when we're in the middle of a pandemic. It prays for God's protection and then assembles while taking the obvious precautions that we can take, like maintaining some distance and wearing some face masks and so such, such things that we, as we had to do during the pandemic. Superstition might pray over the building and then abandon all that because we prayed. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and one is saying, I don't need to, to, to embrace facts because... I've prayed. The other facts and faith all go together. Faith is a function of knowledge. Superstition is the enemy of knowledge, okay? Faith enhances lives. Superstition hurts people. And that's why so many people got sick when they came to church, because of that. But uh, Night Reliance Church is about enhancing lives with God's truth. And it is about avoiding the abuse of Scripture, which hurts people. And uh, I think if you wanted to really boil down what we're about here, we are about people being better for coming here. Always better for it. If people are not better for coming here, if their lives are not enhanced as a result of encountering God's truth, then we're doing something wrong here. And so my prayer every day is that I might be an instrument to enhance the lives of the people that I touch as I deploy God's truth. And my prayer is that our church would be that way as well, and that he would always make us aware of ways to do, lean into that better and make us aware of ways that we might be falling short. Our goal is to enhance lives with God's truth. And with that said, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for the example that you set of enhancing lives. Um, and uh, you didn't only say it, you lived it in a way that we could all follow. And now we pray that we would be able to follow your example of enhancing lives. Um, And as we come into this season where so many people um, are thinking about you and your, I mean, the the Christian symbolism, the Christian accounts are just going to be in front of our faces over and over again throughout the holidays. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to share just what you did for us 
to redeem us. Help us to take advantage of every opportunity as we are confronted with your scripture and we're around loved ones. Lord, let this be a wonderful season where your, your gospel is furthered and advanced. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.